1987, you walk away. Yeah. Now, there's been a lot written about this. What can you tell me about walking away that maybe you haven't talked about before? <laughs> well, it was a combination of the passion for music had left me. I could not, you know, find the honest passion for singing. And because of that, I was stepping into some other, uh, uh, dare I say, party behaviors to augment my frustrations. And then I think my voice was also suffering. I think everything started to suffer for me. Uh, and it did not help restore my passion for music. So eventually, the feeling just got very clear to me that I need to just stop. And I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was going to do or where I was going to go. All I knew is that I can't keep doing what I'm doing. I need to just stop because this is not going anywhere good. Now, were drugs a part of this? Women a part of this? Uh, certainly drugs and drinking were a part of it, of course, yeah. I mean, that came with the times, you know. Uh, it's a funny thing about success. When you do get a chance to finally live that dream that you, 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 you wanted when you were seven years old, eight, nine, 12 years old, and you get it. Now, I'm not complaining, Dan. I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you in my heart. When you finally get that and you're loving it, it's kind of at some point a little bit of a luster starts to wear off over and over again if you keep touring and keep turning the same wheel over and over again. And I think it leaves room for the opportunity for other enhancements, dare I say, to replace some of the lack of luster that it once had. So you walk away? I walked away. Did you ever? What did you do? <laughs> I bought a Harley Davidson in Visalia, California, because my, my hometown was Hanford, California, about 18 miles away. And I would drive that Harley in the summertime. Back Excuse then. me, had you been into motorcycles before? No. I decided that was going to be my new passion, was motorcycles. So I bought this Harley, and I, there was no helmet law back then, and my long hair was flying 20 feet in back of me, you know? And I, I rediscovered parts of my life that I had completely forgot about. For instance, the Central San Joaquin Valley can get up to 110, 112 degrees every summer. But when you're riding a motorcycle by an alfalfa field, the alfalfa fields on both sides of the motorcycle drops at sometimes 10 degrees. You feel like you're in, a, in, a, in an air-conditioned environment. And I thought, well, I remember that when I was a kid. So I was reconnecting with my childhood and actually reconnecting with the loss of my mother that I'd lost. You know, she had died before. Um, and went out to visit other departed relatives, pretty regular, to try to just connect with my life where it is right at that time. Because when you re-enter the Earth's atmosphere of your life after a ride like that, you got to do something. you got to ground yourself somehow. So I did a lot of that. Well, but you were gone. You were off for a long while. You can only ride the motorcycle so often. You can only visit with your relatives and even right. your parents' graveside for often. What else did you do? Did you develop a hobby? Did you develop a... I'll tell you what I did not do is I couldn't go near music because I had this PTSD thing with music still going on. It was very, very uncomfortable for me. And I uh, was afraid that the passion for music would never come back. So because of that, I just left it alone and thought I'd already lived the dream of dreams. There's nothing much more to do and, uh, in that area. And so I'll just leave it alone. And then time goes on. I ran into somebody. Uh, Patty Jenkins became a friend of mine, a, a brilliant director, who ended up directing the movie Monster with their, Charlie Theron. She got a hold of my attorney and wanted to use Don't Stop Believing," so we all had to agree to the song being used in the movie Monster. And we became great friends. One time, Patty was working on this Lifetime special called Five, and it was about a cancer survivor. And um, I was watching the editing process and everything, and there was this woman in this moment in the patio of the hospital. And uh, 
it's just the cameras panning a crust and the narrator's talking about the people who are surviving their cancer. And they all look like they're doing fine having lunch in the patio of the hospital. And I said, go back to, who is that? And she said, well, that's Kelly Nash. I said, well, who's Kelly Nash? She said, well, she's a PhD psychologist that you know, has friends and I just put real cancer patients because she has had cancer. Um, and, uh, but she's, you know, she's doing okay. And I said, well, do you have her email? Patty looked at me funny because she knows I don't do that. So I said, yeah, do you have her email? And she said, why? I said, I don't know. There's something about her. I, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to send her an email, take her to lunch or something. Is it possible? Just tell your friend Steve would love to take her to lunch. So she does that. And I wait on pins and needles for two weeks. And the next thing I know, I get an email back and I'm, I'm over the moon. And I took her to dinner one night and we were inseparable after that. So there was a lot going on in my life, but nothing like this had happened. Uh, she was three years fighting breast cancer, but you'd never know it. Uh, PhD psychologist, brilliant. Um, and we were inseparable for the time we were together, which was a year and a half approximately until she passed away six, year, six years ago. There was just this other layer of connection. Um, and in fact, I told her, I feel like I've always known you. I, I used to tell her I loved you before I met you. I love you now and I always will. Because that's what it felt like. It was so familiar. How did this affect you? Having this love affair with her, the likes of which you say you never experienced before or since. And what did you learn from that? You're good at this, Dan. You know that, don't you? <laughs> if somebody hasn't told you that, they should tell you again. It has severely affected me because I was pretty much in isolation before I met her. And she pulled me out of isolation. And emotional isolation and even physical isolation. Um, one night we were together and she said, uh, Honey, I, I need to ask you something. If something was ever to happen to me, will you make me one promise? I said, well, what's that? My favorite time is when the, we'd talk each other and sleep in the dark. And that was that night's conversation. I said, what's that? She said, if something was to happen to me, promise me you won't go back into isolation. For I think it would make this all for naught. And I just thought, that statement was so huge. It was like she was looking at her whole life, being diagnosed, her struggle during the struggle of cancer and the possibility of us not being together has to have some kind of meaning. And um, I made the promise. So that's how the last record came about. I kept the promise and I dedicated the record to her and I'm talking to you now. I'm, I'm doing everything I can to not fall back into isolation again because I made a promise. <laughs>